So, hi everyone, people of the internet. I am here with Michelle Lee, founder of Clever Carbon, and she's got a bunch of stuff happening at South by Southwest. It's just a bunch of things, uh, too many to list, really. Um, but I'll have links to those in the description. But Michelle, thank you uh, so much for coming on. Um, so tell me a bit about Clever Carbon and your mission with the company, uh, for lack of be a better term. Yeah. So, you know, Clever Carbon is, I don't think of it as a business. I don't think of it as a company. I don't think of it as a startup. I think of Clever Carbon as my passion project and a way for me to give back to the planet, to everyone on it by teaching people about carbon footprint literacy. And the reason why I think learning about carbon footprint is really important is because right now we only have qualitative ways of describing um, our impact on the planet. So for example, a single use coffee cup is bad, but flights are also bad, but flights are magnitudes of scale um, more bad than a coffee cup. And in order, you know, if we don't have a way to quantify the impact, we can't, um, you know, make better decisions about our actions. We can't change our behavior. And, you know, that famous saying, what you can quantify, you can change. And, you know, knowing everything that we do has a carbon footprint, whether, you know, it's us on the Zoom, Austin, or charging your phone, or the apple that you ate, or, um, you know, the flight that you took, or the, the shower because we need electricity to heat the water. Um, everything that we do has a carbon footprint and um, everyone sort of has an annual carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon emissions they emit in a year. And most people don't know that. So at Clever Carbon, we're trying to teach people about what carbon footprint is in a really hip and fun way so that you know we don't have to use words like emergency and crisis and climate um, we're just teaching people clever things to know and clever things to do and hopefully as a result we're attracting more people that are interested in learning about these clever topics and clever things to do and we have more brains collectively um, taking climate action even though you know some of us may not know that that's what we're doing yeah and um we actually have a little test on your website, clevercarbon.io. Um, yes. I actually took it. Um, um, and it gives you this feedback about, it asks you, I think, five or six questions. Mm -hmm. um, like, did you take a flight? How often do you take the take a flight? Um, I think it uh, is on a scale of like zero to five or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I can't exactly remember. But um, and it gives you a result of here's how you're impacting your environment. Here's how these things can, well, hurt, hurt or, or help your environment. And there's a lot of resources, uh, too, probably too many to get into. I could probably get all nerdy about this. Um, but so for those who aren't as science minded as me, uh, who didn't have an A in chemistry or maybe just don't really interact with science that much. Can you explain a little bit of uh, what a carbon footprint is for those who just are just don't know what it is? Yeah, so carbon footprint is really a measure of the amount of carbon dioxide that's released in a particular um, activity. Um, and you can really set the boundaries. Like for example, um, there are carbon emissions when you fly from New York to Tokyo. So you can have a carbon footprint of that flight. There are carbon emissions that are uh, released when, you know, we, um, you know, consume an apple and there's a carbon footprint of an apple. Uh, you could have a carbon footprint of, you know, the amount of time that you um, charge your phone, whether it's an hour, um, there's a carbon footprint for that. But if you wanted to measure the amount of carbon emissions um, that happen when you charge your phone for 30 minutes, there's the carbon footprint for that. So really there's kind of no boundaries um, but typically we look at the entire life cycle of um, an item like for example an apple and I can go into that in a little bit but really um, you know carbon footprint is the measure of the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere from an activity 
and we release carbon dioxide when we burn fossil fuels. So, you know, oil, natural gas, for example, when we use those for energy, we burn these fossil fuels and we then emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we now have a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is one of them. There's also methane, which is almost 25 times more potent, uh, nitrous oxide, which is almost 300 times more potent, but the most common greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. And when we have all these greenhouse gases in the air and every day, you know, our activities, we're releasing more, um, the concentration of these gases increases and it traps heat. So this is what's sort of causing, you know, global warming and climate change is that we have too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today the heat can't escape our planet and hence um, it's getting warmer. And carbon footprint is a measure of the amount of specific carbon dioxide that gets released um, when, for example, we plant an apple and consume it. And I'd love to get into a little bit more around sort of where do carbon emissions from an apple come from if um, that's a good segue. Yeah, for sure. I, I was actually gonna use a the coffee example you mentioned earlier, um, because that's one of my favorite drinks. Um, and um, for those who don't know, I'll just explain it really quickly. Um, coffee doesn't come from the US, even though it has the Starbucks logo on it. It comes from places like Colombia. I actually talked to somebody who filmed in Colombia and was talking about um, the effects on the environment there. I think the film was Vanishing Fog, which is also at South by. Um, I think premiered either today or yesterday. But anyways, the point is, there's a journey that coffee beans take to get to that bag. There's um, labor to get to the workers to the work site, and, which is, um, so that's gas. Um, um, and then you've got all the machines they use to extract the coffee beans from the, I believe the ground. I'm not that uh, well versed in how the coffee gets made literally. Um, and then there's ships that goes on to get back to the US or wherever it needs to go. Um, so that's more gas. And then a gas to vacuum seal all the bags. And then but that gets put on a truck so there's more um, um, gas there and then to get to your house or to get to from the supermarket to your house that's also gas or um, if you have an electric car uh, some it, it, the science there I don't know exactly what that is but that's the journey but um, yeah let's talk about the apple I mean let's build on your coffee example so I think you got a lot of the different components, right? It's planted in a different country. Um, you know, oftentimes we do need machinery to help with, you know, the planting, the watering, but an important um, sort of greenhouse gas source is the fertilizer, right? Depending if you're yeah, yeah. It's organic or just, you know, regular farming, um, you know, the fertilizers produce nitrous oxide, which again is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And then, you know, you mentioned a few things along sort of the life cycle, but then, you know, the roasting of the coffee requires energy as well, right? Electricity or maybe gas. And then it gets to the facilities. Then we consume the coffee. So some of us may you know, use coffee machines, which use electricity. Um, you know, we boil water. So there's like kettles, uh, you know, electric kettle or gas yeah. kettle. But then after that, there's still more, Austin. So for example, what do you do with the coffee grinds? Do you throw them in the garbage and they go to landfill? Yeah. Or do you compost them, right? So there's a lot to think about. Additionally, if you drink a latte or a cappuccino, you're using milk. And the milk actually has the majority of the carbon footprint. So if we look at a cup of coffee, on average, um, a cup of coffee is 50 grams of carbon dioxide, but a latte is 330 grams, right? Um, that's a dairy latte. Uh, yeah. A plant-based latte is on average 140 grams. So it's less than dairy latte, but 
you can see, you know, milk actually has a lot to do with the carbon emissions of our coffee. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, and that's, and even mine's even kind of more complicated because I buy whole bean, so then I grind it with um, conical burr grinder. Mm -hmm. um, the coffee snobs have entered the chat, um, and um, then I, um, I use an AeroPress. So let's see, I electric uh, kettle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, heated water, so, um, and then, let's see, I pour that in the thing, and do an AeroPress, which has its own plastics, and then, um, then I get rid of the grounds, once it's all brewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think AeroPress has a disposable filter, so, yeah. yeah, there's, there's that, but, you know, also something to think about is, you know, carbon footprint is not the be all end all. Um, we have a water issue that may soon become a water crisis. Uh, we have so many people on this planet, but we only have, um, you know, a finite amount of freshwater reserves. And so what is the water footprint of coffee? You know, you have to water the plants, um, you know, we use water to make coffee, but you know, we use water to produce the filters that we use. And so, you know, carbon footprint is one aspect of the equation. Um, water footprint, waste footprint are other things that we should consider as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'd imagine that'd be several thousand liters at that point. I mean, I use 0.5 in mine, 0.5 mm -hmm. liters. And mm -hmm. I'd imagine for a coffee bean farm, it'd be several hundred, if not several thousand. Yeah. And I think most of the water is actually used in the agriculture sort of upstream where we're, you know, watering the plants and, and whatnot. So, yeah. And I think it's also worth pointing out that a few years ago, California had to develop a way to, I don't know if it was capture water or create water. I, they have these little black, um, balls that they put in the rivers um, that do some, I, I forget exactly what they do. It's been a few years, so uh, excuse the ignorance there. Um, but they had, and they're still fighting for, um, like when we went, when I went out to California, well, let's see, that was five years ago now. Well, it will be five years in this December. Um, they had signage saying, hey, Turn off water as soon as you're done using it. Mm -hmm. um, don't don't like run the tap um, the whole time you're running washing your hands. Um, just wet your hands, turn it off, then then uh, the soap, and then turn it back on. Do a quick rub, turn it back off. Mm -hmm. And that's also another area we could probably talk about endlessly is. Um, the emissions that come from public bathrooms, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of these places have electric uh, dryers now, Dyson ones, uh, in addition to all the other stuff that comes with doing a public bathroom. I mean, is it hundreds of people coming in a day, maybe thousands, so who knows? But um, what 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 are some big ways you found that has helped? reduce that footprint? Yeah, so if you take our carbon footprint quiz, uh, we ask six questions. You know, how do you normally commute? Do you walk? Do you use public transportation? Do you use a car? Um, so, you know, the way we commute and get around is a big source of carbon emissions. Um, flying is a huge uh, source of carbon emissions. So, you know, in our quiz, we ask, approximately how many hours uh, did you fly last year? Our diet also is a huge um, part. And, you know, carbon emissions from agriculture and food in general make up a quarter of global emissions, which is a really, really, really big category. And this includes both, you know, farming dairy, um, you know, farming the feed for the cattle, um, you know, farming uh, vegetables and wheat for humans. So it's that it includes all those things, but our diet plays a really important role. And 
just an FYI, uh, you know, on average, a, a potato is around 40 grams of CO2. Uh, a serving of chicken is around 1300 grams of CO2, right? Magnitude is lower, right? Than a potato. And then a serving of beef is 7,700 grams. So almost 8,000 grams and eight times more, um, uh, you know, carbon intensive than a serving of chicken. So like, again, knowing these numbers and not using qualitative words to say, oh, meat is bad, you know, like, what does that even mean? Now we have the yeah. numbers to understand. Yeah, for sure. I, I, because I think anytime you just go into binary um, decisions, it kind of says, okay, well, I don't like this because now my favorite things are, I can't do them. Um, but I mean, I, I've, I've been able to just, it, it's, it's pretty easy, um, I, I, I think. Um, and it kind of surprised me how high mine were, um, considering um, the place I live and everything like that. I'll, I thought I was pretty low, but apparently not, um, which is interesting. Um, because, yeah, I just, because I'm with, um, a lot of people will do the uh, van life um, as a way of reducing emissions or just kind of downsizing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of on that air end of the scale, but, um, but like our ener energy isn't clean down here, so. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting, but it, it, it's going to, I think, improve in the next five years. Um, the Arkansas governor um, just announced the whole thing. If you get Arkansas clean by, I think he said 2030. Mm. That's amazing. I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's realistic, but it's worth trying, um, especially since a lot of EVs, um, actually, no, not EVs, electric chargers. Are going out around um, the major metropolitan areas, um, so, so that'll that'll be interesting to see. But um, I know you said you had a hard out, so I'm gonna uh, let you go. Enjoy South by. Um, I, I will be here. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Austin. Mm -hmm.